The purpose of this video is to give an introduction and some background regarding leases for financial reporting purposes under US GAAP. So the, the first thing is, uh, let's define what a lease is. And when we talk about a lease, it's a contract between a leaseor and a leasee. The leaseor being the one that originally owns the asset and the leasee technically is the one that rents. And when you enter into one of these contracts, the lease conveys the right to control or use for some time uh, the asset in, in the asset uh, that we're talking about in exchange for some consideration. So when you have these attributes, that is considered a lease contract. And the idea of transfer of control is important for purposes of the leaseor in determining whether that satisfies the performance obligation required to recognize revenue. So that component of transfer of control is what determines whether a sale technically occurred in the, in the case of sale type leases. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit more uh, information regarding the actual leases uh, and the accounting for them in a, in a separate video. But let this video just be a quick introduction to the idea or the concept behind the concepts behind leases. And there are many advantages to the leasee, um, and uh, that includes the fact that uh, for the leasee, technically you're not necessarily having to uh, buy this outright, so it can help you conserve cash, and you reduce your risk as the leasee. Uh, uh, the risk of having an asset you buy and it becoming obsolete. So the residual value protection is what we would call it, is something that is an advantage for the leasee because uh, afterwards you don't have to keep this asset or uh, own it in the sense that it could become obsolete. And a lot of times with lease transactions, you have greater flexibility in terms of the financing structures that you can do. So it just provides way more flexibility than simply outright buying the asset. So those are some of the advantages for the leasee. And then for the leaseor, uh, allowing alternate financing approaches like a lease aids in selling. And it's also an extra revenue source for the leaseor. Okay. So uh, whatever it takes for the client to buy the, I mean, to actually, let me restate that. Whatever it takes to have this transaction executed is what we'll do. So in the case of a leaseor, uh, you know, if you can offer this type of arrangement to clients, it just helps in generating revenues. And banks are usually the ones that uh, finance a lot of the lease leases uh, for the leaseor and the leasee. And uh, as well as uh, captive leasing companies, which is kind of like your manufacturer's leasing uh, having a subsidiary with a leasing arm. And then you also have a few independents is what they're referred. They have a small share, but what they spe specialize in is uh, having innovative arrangements for leasees. So whatever the needs are of the leasee, they have more flexibility, these independents, in arranging that, which again is one of the advantages for the leasee in terms of uh, engaging in a lease as opposed to buying. Um, a little bit of the past, just very quickly in terms of leases. Um, previously, we only had two classifications in leases, and it was either an operating lease or a uh, capital lease or finance lease. These are the sales type. And if criteria was met uh, for it to classify as a finance lease, then from the perspective of the leasee, they would record an asset and a liability on the books as if they were technically buying this asset, okay? And, and again, this is the past. And if the criteria for finance lease was not met or capital lease, then we would uh, treat it as an operating lease, which is basically just a rental of something in the classical way that you would expect. In other words, the asset or the, the, asset or the liability would not make it to the balance sheet and you would only record an expense for the amount you would pay per period. So it was real simple if you had an operating lease. Okay, that's the past. Now, uh, the current period for the leasee, basically, and, and this is 
in the words uh, of the actual standard, practically all leases are now recorded as an asset and a liability, with the simple exception of what is referred to as a short-term lease, which is something less than 12 months, okay? And so what happens now? Well, the finance lease approach is still the same. Okay? You, you still have to capitalize the asset and you still have to recognize the liability on the balance sheet. And then the income statement recognizes some interest expense related to the uh, financing arrangement. And then the leasee amortizes the asset, which we record as a right of use asset. And uh, and that, you know, which it really resembles uh, the past. And just like a loan, your interest expense is going to be higher at the beginning of the period. And as the carrying value of that loan decreases, then the expense for interest goes down. Now, what's different, significantly different now, is that operating leases are now also going to be included on the books, on the balance sheet. So in other words, whereas you did not recognize the asset or the liability in the past, now we are recognizing the asset and the liability on the balance sheet just uh, similar to the finance lease because after all practically all leases now are recorded as an asset and liability and then the income statement uh is just a you recognize a lease expense which is made up of both the interest and the amortization of that right of use asset and it's usually uh it, it, when you do the operating lease your lease expense is going to be the same but we'll talk about that in a separate video where I go into the actual technical aspects of it. So now what is left for what we used to think of the operating lease is now called the short-term lease. And this is the one where you're not going to capitalize the asset or the liability related to that, that asset. Uh, the, the title to the asset remains with the lease soar. And then the leasee, they only recognize a interest, I'm, I'm sorry, not an interest expense, but like a lease expense or a rental expense based on the amount that they pay per period. Okay, so we went from a regime when we had two classifications to one in which we have uh, three classifications. And in a sense, what ended up happening was that the short-term lease uh, based on uh, less than 12 months uh, is now in, in substance uh, accounted for in a similar way as we used, we used to account for operating leases. And now operating leases are resemble more the finance lease uh, approach. By the way, uh, when I put here finance lease and sales type lease, for the lease C, it's commonly referred to as a finance lease, but then from the leaseor's perspective, it's commonly referred to as a sales type lease because what they're doing is selling the asset, even though it's called the lease. Okay, so what are the tests that the leasee has to go through in order to determine whether they have a, uh, a finance lease? The first thing is this is these are the these actually these the rules apply for both the leasee and the leaseor. Okay, so the first thing must be that you have a non-cancelable lease and then you meet one out of the five below. If any, if any of them fails, uh, if all of them fails, I'm sorry, uh, then it's an operating lease. Okay, so these, are the, these rules right here are to determine whether you fall into the finance lease category, and if none of these meet are met, then you fall into the operating lease category. Okay, so the first thing is, um, uh, the title transfers to the leasee at the end of the term. So if under the contract, the lease contract, there is a provision that says that after the end of the lease, the asset is turned over in terms of title to the leasee, then we would say that that is a finance lease. And when we say that it is a finance lease, I want you to think about this. We're basically saying that this asset in substance has been sold. Even though we call the transaction a lease, it technically is a sale. Because think about it, if at the end of the period, the asset turns over to the leasee, then technically that was a sale. So if that were the case, then we would say, okay, that meets that criteria and the transaction can be treated as a finance lease. Or here's another one. 
if there is a, terminar, a termination or a purchase option that is reasonably reasonably certain to be exercised. So if under the contract there's a sort of a, there's something like a bargain purchase option. In other words, the leasee has the opportunity to buy this asset at the end of the lease at a real good price at a bargain. Then any, the way you can think about it is any reasonable person would exercise that option. So if you have that bargain purchase option under the lease contract, then that would be a criteria met, one of the criteria is met to qualify as a finance lease. So as I go through these and the three others, just realize, think about how any of the, if any of these apply, technically it's like you own this asset. And when I say you, I mean the leasee. The third potential test is if the uh, term of the lease is greater to is greater than or equal to 75% of the economic life of the asset itself, then technically you're leasing the asset for almost uh, uh, not an entire but a significant portion of the life of the asset so we would say you know what at that point that asset is technically sold and in computing this ratio here you include the period uh, involved with the bargain uh, renewal option so they give you you know if you are in a lease for 10 years and there's an option to renew for two more years and it's at a bargain then you would to do this test you wouldn't use the 10 years of the original lease, you would also include the two years for that bargain renewal option. So technically you would say, what is 12 years out of the whole life, the whole economic life? And if 12 years out of the whole economic life is 75% or more, then it meets that criteria. Okay, in a similar nature, if the present value of the payments and the present value of the leasey guaranteed residual value, if the present value of those two is greater than 90% of the actual fair market value of that asset, then in a sense, you have basically bought this asset. And we would again, treat it as a finance lease, okay? And if you're wondering what this idea of guaranteed residual value is, um, after the lease is over, the leasee uh, turns over the asset to the leasor, right? And there is a value remaining on that asset. Well, the leasee can guarantee it uh, or not. And if it's a guaranteed residual value, in other words, I'm guaranteeing that it's going to be worth some amount. And when I give it to the leasor, uh, if that's the case, then uh, at that point, uh, that's included for purposes of the test. Okay, we'll see in a few minutes or in a, I'm sorry, we'll see in a different video that this amount right here is used for purposes of the actual test itself, but not for purposes uh, it's used differently for purposes of the actual calculation of the liability under the transaction. And then the last uh, criteria is this. If you have an asset that is so specialized and has such limited use that only the leasee technically could use it, so like custom-made uh, equipment or something, and later on the leasor has no use for it, okay, then that criteria would imply that you technically bought that asset because, because if nobody else is expected to be able to use it, then technically it's yours. So the idea is this. If you have a non-cancelable lease and you meet one of these five, okay, then we would say that the, the lease is considered a finance lease. If it fails all these tests, okay, it does not meet any of them, then at that point, by default, it becomes uh, or is treated as an operating lease. Okay, so that's the, the big picture. The other, the other thing I want to add here is that there is one more test for the lease soar. Okay, and for the lease soar, you can think of it as a, an F here. Okay, but uh, the lease soar has to meet A through E, I mean, or has to uh, do the same test as the lease E with respects to A through E, plus, the F that I'm talking about right here is for the leasor, lease the test, uh, they must determine that collectability is probable. Okay, so collectability for the leasor is probable. For the leasor to be able to account for this lease as a finance lease. So just to recap, this is for the leasor only. They do this additional test. 
So the transact the tr lease cannot be cancelable. Any one of these needs to be met, and then that's for the leasee. And then on top of that, for the leaseor, they also have to make sure that the collectability uh, of these payments is probable. Otherwise, the leaseor cannot treat the transaction as a sale, and they have to keep the asset in their books as opposed to selling it or taking it out as a sale. This concludes the introduction to uh, the idea of, or the concept of leases. In a, a follow-up video, what I'll talk about is how we account for the operating lease, how we account for the finance lease. And that can be, it's gonna be a very technical video, but nevertheless, just uh, use this video to think about the big picture first.